morning, everyone. I believe we should start our session, which is titled Do Not Touch, Self-Regulate the Receive Hub of Social Platforms. Thank you for joining us this early morning after two intense days here at IGF. We see that it's not that many of people who survived by this time, and it's really too early, so thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for this, as we believe, very important discussion of this uh, very urgent and timely topic. My name is Olga Kiriluk, and uh, I'm CEO and founder of uh, the Influencer Platform, which is the Ukrainian-based uh, non-profit organization. In terms of structuring our session, we will first uh, move with the presentations from our speakers, and then we will open the floor for the questions and comments for the public. So just if you have any questions during the presentations, keep them in your mind to ask later on to, the, to our speakers. And uh, coming back to the, to the issue, I would like to mention that when social platforms were first appearing, nobody cared about how these spaces should be regulated. By now, the calls for regulations have probably reached their peak. However, those who are calling for the regulation have often been vague on how this regulation should look like. Whether it is possible for the national governments to extend their regulation to, the, to those uh, companies which are often located abroad and uh, who have their servers hosted in, uh, in other countries than those who are trying to regulate these spaces. No one, neither the regulators nor the companies themselves, have found the right solution yet. But increasingly, the government seems willing to hold social platforms accountable. Even in his opening speech, President Macron mentioned that we have to regulate more. And I believe it's due to the price of this regulation. And I know our speakers have a lot to say on this issue. And here, not to overuse my rights as the moderator, I would like to address my first question to our first speaker, Claudio Lucena, professor at Paraíba State University, researcher at Foundation for Science and Technology in Portugal. So Claudio, in your opinion, what went right with the digital social networking plan and what went wrong? Thank you, Olga. I think we, we could have started by an easier question, maybe for the first <laughs> issue of the morning, but thank you very much for that very provoking uh, first statement or first, first question. Uh, and thank you also for the effort in putting this, this together and for calling our fellow, fellow panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not using up a lot of time because uh, I, I, I was helping Olga structure this, but I would like really to, to give you an introduction as to the path, how we moved from a time where we, as, as the, the title suggests, uh, thought about a, a digital world where do not touch was the absolute rule, to a world where on, 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 on Monday, in, an, in a statement that, in, to my knowledge, was the strongest statement by a head of state in the history of, of IGF, we have moved so fast and so unequivocally in, in the path of a regulation. And I would start a couple of, of my, of the secret statements or secret tweetable phrases I had here were, were, were unfortunately spoiled by Mr. Macron on, on Monday, but I still have him, them here and I, I would like to share with you so we, we could see uh, the path where we are. One of them was, I don't know if, if all of you were here already here on Monday or if you had already had time to reflect upon his words, but one of the sentences was pretty much from the, from the general translation we have here. Regulation is inevitable, it will be done with or without you. Uh, and, and then again, social platforms uh, start to be described by some as a menace or as a threat for uh, democratic societies. And then another comment that when, the, uh, another very interesting comment that he was starting to hear the disapproval by the sole mention of the world regulation. So, uh, taken from Olga's uh, provocation, let, 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 let's, let's start by saying why this, this, this happened, where we were, where are we now, and what are the possible paths for us in the future. So, wh when we were starting to use these this tools, the thing is, uh, what we were exchanging basically back then was information, cat, family videos or personal pictures, general messages. So the amount of information and the sensitivity, I would say, the sensitivity of the information and of the output of the, or, and of the externalities that we were seeing in the environment were not so delicate. 
even if we felt external effects from the use of social media in the past decades, they were not so delicate as they were today. Uh, and, but suddenly, this, this uh, external effect started to be more evident and stronger. Economic development, social development, cultural developments, behavior developments. People started to behave differently over these two decades. Jobs were created over these new platforms. Jobs that did not, and we touched this upon in a, in, a, in a youth session here about the future of jobs. Uh, jobs, content production and dissemination based jobs that simply did not, did not exist 20 years ago started to be created. So a new environment started, started to be forged out of this new uh, environment of the social digital platforms. Uh, and with that, the evident feeling that this world could not be out of control, absolutely out of control, as it was back then suggested by John Curley Barrow. But now it seems that we have touched a, 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 a key point, because over the past two years, interactions concerning invol based, involved, or absolutely connected to these digital platforms have started to interfere directly with democracies. A, a bit before, there was already the explosion of cybercrime, and cybercrime already called for a stronger regulation, for stronger, let's say, points of intervention from sta states, if not absolute regulation. But then cybercrime was already started to developing as a structured uh, framework, in, in, at least in, in, in legal terms. But now, when, when democracies started to start to be touched, then it seems that we have reached the point uh, in, in which this interference cannot go without oversight. And I'm trying to use uh, every time the, the word uh, the, the, the word regulation or, or in, a, in a harder sense, because exactly we, we do not yet know how this is going to be uh, built. Uh, this, this form of, of intervention of, or this form of, of interference in democratic systems has, has taken a, a couple of different uh, profiles from now, a couple of different forms. It could have been more directed to, to, a, to a more profile-based interference as it has, as, it, as it's now a, a bit more clear that it was the case for the American election. It can take much more the, the idea of a sending of mass messages without necessarily profiling characteristics as it has uh, as it seems to have been the case for us back in, in Brazil now in these recent elections. But the thing is, this digital space now mediates a kind of interference that touches directly uh, at least Western re uh, representative democracies. And, and now it seems that we're not moving anywhere else than in the direction of this uh, kind of intervention. Now, where do we go from now? We have witness a couple of times when Joran Marby from, I, from the CEO of ICANN mentions the fact that uh, for the community that we're doing something that has never been done. We're building policies about things that were never done back uh, in the history of mankind. So, and I, I, I do not, I do not want to be innocent or naive enough to, to deny the fact that in that kind of speech there is a, there is a, a, a hidden message that says, okay, we will take the input from you, civil society, provided you don't, you don't get much in the way and, and things go on uh, without a lot of, uh, without detouring much uh, from where we're going. But in essence, the statement is true. We're thinking of something now. What we, what we have to do now in the dynamics that we have to do, because we have regulated other businesses or other forms of, of economic uh, activities of global reach before. But this has characteristics that have never been there. It's uh, wider in the sense that it touches all human activities than ever before. It's deeper in the sense that it does not only touch all activities, it touches them very much. It transforms all of them. And it's quicker, faster than ever. <laughs> So it touches all activities, it goes deep down in each of them, and it is very fast. 
simultaneous in, 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 in most of the cases. So I think these are characteristics that render this new challenge that we have before us different from the ones we have before. Now, where do we go now? Fortunately, President, President Macron touched pretty much this, uh, the very same key that I'm, uh, than the one I'm referring about, uh, Joran Marby. He said, we need to learn how to regulate together. So this uh, sends a message that we, we, we are probably going for somewhere which is closer, or, or at least the suggestion is for us to go closer to something we know very much at, at the IDF, which is the multi-stakeholder mo multi model with its uh, pitfalls, but also with its uh, advantages. Uh, our fellows Danielle Lee Thompson and David Murar has, have recently published in the Wall Street Journal a, a sketch of a proposal for a, a multi-stakeholder oversight over content of platforms that I think it's also a way, uh, it's a suggestion, it's a sketch, there's nothing very much developed in it. Uh, but, and, I, and, I, and I'm leaving you with this here so we can go on with our uh, fellows and their, their comments. The fact is we're moving for a stronger oversight at least of these platforms. If we leave, because that, that the movement from the platforms is also interesting, they, uh, they absolutely defended the, the, the environment, which, is very, which very much reflects the American innovation environment of not touching something that was under development under the, in the beginning of, of the days. And it's clear that they see now that the movement for some oversight, some kind of monitoring is going there. So they are partners, current, if, if, if you check the news all over the world, they are partners in the movements that are discussing development. So they, they have already sh shifted their minds. They have already understood that it's not going to be uh, like in the beginning of the times forever. So now it's f the call and the message I want to leave in the end is now maybe it's the time for civil society to recognize that movement, acknowledge and find ways to meaningfully contribute to this movement that is going to result in some kind of harder intervention, monitoring and oversight by governments, but can al that can also be shared by other stakeholders. This is pretty much the scenario I wanted to, to paint, Olga. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Claudia. And just a very quick uh, follow-up question from me, because uh, you are saying that some uh, oversight is uh, inevitable when we are talking about the regulation of the social platforms. And uh, for me, it sounds uh, a bit confusing when the governmental officials are talking about that we need uh, to regulate together but they use the term multilateral, not multi-stakeholder. So I'm confused whether it's that they are not understanding the nature of this, uh, of these two different, um, let's say, uh, concept, concepts of regulation, or is it really that uh, they are just trying to give the confusing messages uh, to the audience? And so do you see whether there is the place for the social platforms to get engaged into this uh, new kind of regulatory order which is being proposed by the governments? Oh. If you mean just or also again a, a quick answer and then we can debate a little bit afterwards. If if you mean the social platforms to engage in this kind of, of exercise, definitely, the, the lobby of these companies have been well organized enough to weigh in in any legislative process around the world. What I'm not sure about about is about our ability as a civil society to weigh weigh in and also discuss this, N never on the same uh, on, a, on on an equal footing, but somehow. Thank you. And now moving to our next speaker, uh, Nicolas Diaz Ferreira, who is research fellow at the University of Duisburg as a member of the PDP for e project for methods and tools for GDPR compliance. And Nicolas would share with us uh, his thoughts on the role of risk awareness in social networks. What is that and why is that needed? Please, Nicolas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Olga, for, for the invitation. Um, yeah, um, I think that uh, we should go back maybe to a more general question is why people disclose so much personal information on, on, on the internet, especially in, on social networks as like Facebook. Um, from psychology, you can identify different theories that are more related to the personal characteristics of the people, namely people with high levels of narcissism or uh, people with a high level of seek for popularity, other ones that disclose more private information. And partially that's truth, but I think we should remember that computers are social actors and they modulate up in a certain extent our perception of our personal information. Um, what I mean that is that our digital data is intangible and we perceive it from the 
uh, we perceive it through the uh, interfaces of media technology. And uh, media technology modulates our perception of the value of, of such of information. Um, if we trace a parallelism in the, from the real world and the offline world, I think we're more attached to our private information when, it's, uh, when we are uh, on, a, on an offline context. So for example, if someone stops me in the street and asks me, asks me for my passport, I will not give it away it's just like that. I, even more, I will have a visceral reaction, you know, this burning sensation in your stomach when something bad's happening. Um, unfortunately, that visceral connection with our data is not happening when our data has a digital support. The only moment when that visceral connection, when we feel our data, takes place is when something bad's happening. And what does it mean when a risk is materialized? In terms of risk assessment or in terms of, uh, of risk awareness, uh, I would say that media platforms are quite light. Um, and why do I say this? If you look at the interface of, uh, of a social media platform like Facebook or, or Twitter, I would say they look quite flawless. So there's no risk element there. E even more, if you look at the, at the privacy policy, at least I have tried and I could not find the word risk in any part of the policy. And again, in the real world, we interact with risky situations almost daily. I mean, crossing the street in the right place or uh, buying products or services, we have a higher risk awareness what can go wrong. And even more, we have instruments that tells us how risky it is to perform an action or to consume some risk, uh, so, or, sorry, or to consume some products. For example, health warning labels on cigarette packages, it tells you that it gives you cancer. I mean, it's not the same if I tell you smoking is cool, then smoking gives you cancer. So your attitude towards that product will change. And I think that people, uh, designers of media technologies are really, maybe on purpose, <laughs> failing the, to create that uh, risk awareness regarding their products. I mean, which are the risks of, for example, self-disclosure? You can have uh, harassment, identity theft, uh, cyberbullying, grooming, and the list go on and on and on. But it, it's true, you don't find any kind of cues about what can go wrong. It, they often social platforms introduce themselves like spheres that are free of uh, any risk. And that actually modulates your, 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 your perception and your attitude towards the, using the platform. And uh, of course, if you think that there's no risk, you will disclose more information. When the risk factor comes into play, you're more unlikely to disclose information. And of course, that affects the digital economy and the business model of the platforms. So um, I arrived to the conclusion that we should be more, uh, um, we should demand more risk awareness from the from the, from the platforms, and uh, and essentially, I don't know if this uh, this should be included in the policy or, as I do it in my on my research, we try to find uh, the introduction of preventative technologies in the interface of the of the social media platforms, so people can be more aware about what can happen with their data, and I'm not saying what what the platform can do with your data, that that's another discussion, and of course we should have it as well. Uh, but which are the risks of exposing their lives on the, on, on the internet? So uh, I think that, um, I think that we should we should concentrate more in, in developing the, the instruments for risk assessment, either uh, both in, in a user-centered level and also in the, in, in the um, in, in the service, uh, in, at the service level, I think I think risk is something that has been neglected for a very long time, and it's a crucial uh, it's a crucial aspect on uh, on on self -re and on regulating the the internet. Thank you, Nicolas. So, do you believe that the risk awareness should be also embedded in the regulations when we are talking about the social platforms? Um, absolutely. I think we as a consumers of media technologies or uh, um, as users of media technologies, we have the right to know what can go wrong. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, we owe people that chance. We should work harder in that direction. Because as I said, we have it in the offline world. We have it in, in our daily life. When we buy a car, we have standards for making, for uh, producing cars. When, and, and we know that those standards comply with, um, um, with uh, security and, uh, and security and safety standards as well. Uh, so I think we should develop those standards, we should develop those best practices and should be around risk awareness, yeah.
Thanks a lot for this very interesting uh, point of view. And uh, now I think uh, not less interesting uh, uh, point uh, will be presented by our next speaker, Salvador Camacho, who is co-founder and CEO of Calpa Protección de Digital, the first domain names consulting firm in Mexico. I can uh, intellectual property constituency member, co-founder and CEO of uh, GGWP Foundation, which is an esports NGO. So, uh, Salvador, could you please share with us, uh, can the domain name serve uh, as a way of trying to have independence from social media and how this could look like? Thank you, Olga. Well, um, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I know it's early, and uh, <laughs> but thank you very much for your time. And yeah, first of all, uh, uh, I totally agree, agree with uh, what said Nicholas. You know, uh, we're like in the real digital, uh, real life and digital life, we're like, uh, the boundaries are getting more difficult to observe. Every day we're like uh, getting more involved into digital world and into, and getting embraced along with our uh, non-digital life. So uh, first of all, I, I, I feel that we have the need to raise a general awareness on what's happening of what happens in digital life, it, it impacts in our real life or our analog life. We need to raise the awareness. Uh, uh, we need to uh, know and to, uh, a, a lot of people that are here uh, are aware of this, but outside of these rooms, there's uh, like maybe 90% of people that are not aware of the impact that social media has in their lives. So, first of all, I feel like uh, these boundaries are like more uh, difficult to observe. Second, that uh, we uh, need to start uh, with this awareness around people who start like getting connected to the internet and maybe not only to the internet, but they're like feeling that they're connected to the internet via social media. So that's for me a huge problem because they're like trying to understand internet maybe just as a uh, social media app, for example, Facebook. There's a lot of people in Mexico that is getting connected for the first time, but they're getting connected to Facebook, not to the internet. And that's a huge problem because they're giving that away. They don't have a clue of about uh, the, all the data management that Facebook is doing, and also as Nicholas mentioned, there's no risk assessment around this. There's no way that people that are not uh, uh, very well uh, trained to understand these kind of issues can have the knowledge that they're giving the data away. The data that it's uh, feeding every time these social media behemoths are, are like uh, using it to what? to give them, yeah, maybe something useful, but they're living for, for that. So after this, uh, I have like studied this and tried to reach a conclusion around domain names. I'm saying this because uh, I, I, I'm a legal counsel of a registry, dot .bar and dot .rest. So uh, we have seen that uh, one of our major competitors in the market is not other registries, is not other domain names, but Facebook, but social media. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier to open an account on Facebook to promote your business or to promote yourself as, I don't know, uh, an influencer or a speaker or an attorney or the service that you give, then it's easier to have a Facebook account than to buy and to grow a domain name. So. I believe that that's a pretty uh, interesting issue. Why? Because a lot of people, uh, for saying this like a, in an analog, analog uh, way to say it, they're building their houses in somebody else's terrain, in somebody else's uh, house. They only have a room in somebody else's house instead of having their own house. So yeah, we, we have been studying this and we believe that uh, maybe having a domain name can be this part of being an independent from this uh, social uh, media kingdom to uh, where we can have not only our own land, but our own space, our own house, and most important, our freedom. Why? Because we can manage it. We decide 
what we can put there. We decide, uh, even though that we are responsible for the data that we, that we receive, yeah, but we need to start like uh, getting out of Facebook, getting out of Twitter. Yeah, use them, but be aware that we're giving them data. So that's, that's, that's a very uh, important issue. And also, I, I want to state that uh, technological tools are neither bad or good. They're just tools. So the way we use them is what we uh, what are made of. So as, as, as an example, Facebook in the, preview, in the early days of Facebook was like very naive, only to share photos, only to share GIFs, we we'll still share GIFs and we we'll still share memes, but it was like very naive, it was like very innocent. Right now, it's a whole different, it's a whole different world on Facebook. There are a lot of fake news, there are a lot of uh, uh, political stuff that is like changing the way also that we thought. So uh, we need to be aware that uh, technological tools are just tools. They're not good or bad. So, and we also have to address this uh, paradigm that uh, the more information that we have, the more ignorance we're becoming as a society because we're fluted by information. We're like getting more ignorant every time because we're on a, I don't know, on a Facebook uh, feed and sometimes like uh, we're seeing uh, very interesting political news and suddenly we, we see a cat falling down or then we saw a meme about, uh, I don't know, the Walking Dead final season or whatever. So we are in this moment that we're fluted by information and that we need to start like addressing what kind of information we need or we want to because so uh, the thing that uh, we have uh, reached a conclusion is that we have to be aware of what we want. If we want to have fun only, it's okay. Have fun on Facebook, have fun on social media. But if we want to go further, be aware that, uh, yeah, we need to, uh, to explain uh, and to address that we need to be aware of that f social media, we all know that they're using our data, but we need to uh, maybe start to apply them to, <coughs> sorry, to getting maybe paid for the use of that media, or at least know why and how are they using it. So yeah, data is not the new oil. A lot of people last year started saying that data was the new oil. I don't believe that, because all oil is gonna get, uh, it's a, it's a non-renewable uh, source. Data, we can have data about everything, about walking, about talking, about sharing, about memes, about everything. So data, it's infinite. So the last, uh, the last, uh, my last conclusion is that uh, maybe we should start like getting paid by social media behemoths for the data that uh, they're using. Thank you, Salvador. That's uh, really very interesting points you made. I myself was never thinking of this uh, alternative comparison of having a domain name as, uh, as really an alternative to having the profile on the Facebook because really it's so easy. You just go to the social platform, you create the account, which takes you like a few minutes and that's it. And uh, to have the domain name, you need to, to take a few more extra steps. You need to pay for that. So of course, uh, like it's in our human nature just to, to opt for, for, the easier, for the easier ways, that's why. And this very well resonates uh, with what Nicholas was saying, that uh, we really need a more risk awareness. We really need to talk to, to, to people to, to get them uh, to know the information about how their data is used. Because uh, for many, it's just a choice of convenience to, to go to the social platforms and to use them. So thank you once again very much for this interesting uh, presentation. And uh, now I want uh, to pass the floor to Natalia Filina, who is a member of the European uh, European at large organization at ICANN and a member of Internet Society. Uh, Natalia, what do you think about the future of the regulation of the social platforms? Uh, should we or could we move with the self-regulation uh, as, it, as it was starting or should we really reshape this regulatory environment? Good morning. Thank you, Olga. Uh, thank you uh, to you all for your early morning time. I am present here, private sector, and I would like to have a short speech on behalf of 
uh, all of us end users. Uh, the number of positive opportunities of social media platform is real tremendous. We can understand exactly that we um, not just uh, equal access to the internet, but uh, exactly equal access to social media platform can, uh, can give us a lot of opportunities for very comfortable, very uh, interesting uh, new digital life, often without real life, but it depends. So uh, we have now very, uh, very diversity worldwide communications, uh, ability to get knowledge, uh, to have a work online, to have uh, to to get a freedom of our, our for our expression, uh, to get an um, uh, the internet uh, alternate news from different people. It's uh, I think it's very important in uh, in our today. And um, mm, very important that everyone can become an influencer. We can uh, be, we can become the source of really changes in our society. For example, we can uh, we can uh, create some humanitarian projects and can be leaders of it. There is two cherries on the top of this cake: our content and our personal uh, date. Who is creators? Uh, we can say uh, we we know we are, but uh, who is owner? Uh, we want to say we are, but uh, we can be sure, because um, because uh, if honesty, we can uh, um, we know that all of we send it to social media platform, all of our contact sometimes start to live with new interesting life without uh, our participant, uh, without guarantee respect to our privacy and, uh, and copyrights. We know it. And uh, in the case of, uh, we know the moderators are from social media platform and s social media can, uh, can immediately delete our accounts and we can lose of, of our content. Um, um, photos, text, uh, what uh, we can create and uh, posts before. So, um, internet companies are, uh, uh, are, are both at this show. They have uh, all of it and they have uh, authority. And we know um, this, uh, this corrupts this guy. We know uh, they say that once upon a time they uh, they were in small room of campus thought and uh, thought of how can uh, he build some and create some platform just for people. Uh, but now we uh, know that these guys um, uh, now have a lot of money, a lot of uh, benefits. Um, a lot of billions have now with our content, uh, content and uh, with social media platform. Um, in this case, I think these guys must be under control. Who does it? I think the states with law, of course. Um, but uh, it's not just easy structure. I think it must be a, a pyramid on the top of it uh, and under state are different organizations. For example, you know, as Global Commission Stability of Cyberspace, uh, for example, now um, uh, this, uh, uh, this is collaboration of uh, some, some states and uh, they working on uh, coordination and defined responsibility and behavior for states and non-state subject in cyberspace. But uh, we don't talk about it. Uh, someone must remind that the states often want uh, to use a social media platform for control and uh, of course manipulate us and our opinion, unfortunately. We as end users don't care about billions. Uh, I think we can uh, say it, uh, which internet company can or already get. 
uh, about it war states and now um, European Union have a discussion about tax for internet company because they are get uh, a lot of a lot of money from um, advertising and using our personal data. Uh, we care exactly about our privacy and copyright. And we need some, I think, some insight, but strict codex of behavior for all participants with goal to solve the real and uh, sharp problems of social media. Um, we can say about sexual violence, about pedophilia, hunting, hating, uh, nazi ideas. We need absolutely whether to use our personal data. And uh, all participants need uh, clear uh, information fields, I think, uh, that, uh, that always depends on our digital culture. Our culture, as Nicholas say, uh, all of our data relates to our personal inside character. Yes, uh, I agree, ability to respond on abuse and immediately escalate if we can see some problem and some illegal contact, for example. Uh, the role of the states uh, and uh, technical companies with last innovation to support this mainstream, uh, to create a system of digital education for society, equal and free for everyone. Uh, this challenge is much more important when we think about statistics. Around 17% of all social media users are teenager and kind, uh, kids under 18. And we can't uh, forget about uh, some vulnerable age people. Uh, no need just talking about protection, I just need to start the process of education. Obviously, it's part of uh, social activis activities of the states. And um, as Olga um, asked me, uh, can we imagine the situation of full self-regulatory social media platform? I, I can say that I don't think so, because uh, self-regulation locates bar norm and rules. And uh, there are very soft borders for participants, because end users and all owners uh, like so much freedom and um, um, it is a big story where two subjects create something and every third immediately uh, think up how can he steal and use it for get uh, some benefits. We need power of love. Uh, and self-regulation is a form of uh, of absolutely freedom and uh, we can understand that impossible situation um, I think because uh, the freedom has an end when uh, mind freedom has an end when someone's freedom uh, has a start and uh, the law should restrict action of owners of large research and big data Thank you, Natalia. And uh, our next speaker is Catherine Garcia van Hoekstraten, lecturer and researcher in data governance, public sector innovation, tech cybersecurity law and policy at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. And I know, Catherine, that you are researching a very interesting topic of the regulatory private public partnerships, and we are really eager to listen uh, what you are thinking on this. Thank you all again. Thank you to all my colleagues that are um, sharing their knowledge and uh, their input on this very important topic. Um, I would like to start with um, a, a bit of a wrap up of what has been mentioned, especially from my colleagues, the, uh, some of them the lawyers and uh, technologists. Um, interesting, with or without you, uh, as Claudio mentioned, and uh, it's, it's not only the name of a song, but it's something that is very much connected. It's not only the title of a song, but it's something very much connected to, in large extent, to my research, but uh, most importantly, to one of the goals of this workshop. Um, yeah, democracy is at stake, and we need to learn on how to regulate together. So, 
yes, there are externalities, and yes, uh, of course, if, for instance, we look at the uh, scale of cyber crimes, this calls for regulation, absolutely. But also for a risk awareness approach, as has been discussed by Nicholas. Um, if we look at the Paris call for security and trust that has been launched recently, um, makes a strong reference to key elements that are connected to this workshop. Namely, the need of managing internet security risk, and I will add the word, a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach to cybersecurity. Um, it can be observed that there, there has been a shift, and there has been a shift to uh, this multi-stakeholder collaborative approach to cybersecurity, in my case, uh, that's the, the field of my research. However, can uh, public-private partnership be a solution? And that's one of the questions of this workshop. Um, I do understand that for public-private partnerships to become a solution should allow the government and many other stakeholders, such as the uh, key internet service providers, the ISPs, the civil society, to pull the resources and know how to tackle key aspects. For example, cybersecurity, critical infrastructure, cyber crimes, the fight against cyber crimes. In the course of my research um, on public-private partnerships countering cyber crimes, I, at the Hague University of Applied Sciences, um, I assess the regulatory and government uh, governance framework impacting the effectiveness of public-private partnerships in countering cyber crimes in Europe. And I have encountered that the PPPs, I would like to use the, uh, the acronym, is more simple, are notoriously complex phenomenon. And in terms of roles, responsibilities, governance of the public and private partners. So in view to the prior, some preliminary questions arise, of course, and these are mostly related to what extent there is an effective regulatory framework, which is the second question uh, you uh, commit me to for this workshop. Um, is, the, is there a governance framework on, on, the public, on the PPPs upholding public values, meaning obviously privacy, security, and any other uh, fairness, transparency, accountability? What methods of, of PPPs um, collaborate, uh, collaborating in countering cyber crimes have been more successful than traditional models of governance? And of course, what roles and responsibilities can and should different parts of the government play in the comprehensive uh, PPPs, in, in my case, uh, the case of my research, to counter cyber crimes. So one of the uh, preliminary con con conclusions I can, um, I can draw from my research is that is there is definitely a piecemeal approach around the legal framework for PPPs which implies challenges, and challenges, as I already mentioned, about roles, and um, of course, also different parts of, of government. I'm, for instance, uh, very much focused on uh, and curious about the role of law enforcement um, and private sector. What are the roles that these play in the, in the PPPs? Um, there is also a fundamental disjunctor between the expectations of the partners in terms of responsibilities and authorities. On the other hand, there is an evolving liability regime, as we can see and observe. Um, jurisdictional challenges, the, nat the nature and ways in which information is being exchanged within the framework of PPPs, for instance. Uh, and this goes, uh, uh, if we look at the specific cases of e-evidence and uh, data forensics, for instance. Challenges facing cross-border investigations of cyber crimes. I'm providing some specific examples. Cross-border data transfers, uh, restrictions, and impacts of these PPPs have on rule of law and fundamental rights of citizens. Um, and of course, these undermine public values. So, for example, if we look at one of the uh, chosen regulatory frameworks uh, in which my research is based, uh, the Council of Europe Budapest Convention on Cyber Crime. Um, otherwise known as the Budapest Convention, is a framework of procedural law for purpose of public-private cooperation on cybercrime and electronic evidence. However, a precondition for international and public-private cooperation is that criminal justice authorities have the necessary powers to investigate cybercrimes and secure, of course, electronic evidence. 
So such a procedural powers, corresponding to some of the articles of the Budapest Convention, uh, namely Article 16 to 21, uh, must be clearly defined in the criminal law and the subject, uh, of course, to conditions and safeguards to meet rule of law requirements. So these, these are some of the, um, the, the challenges I have uh, so far encountered in the course of my research, and I think that really goes to the heart of the question, is there a legal framework and to what extent uh, this is working for the aim of, of PPPs? Thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, now we have around 15 minutes for your questions and comments to our speakers. So uh, the floor is yours. Anyone from the audience? Yes, please. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Maciej Gron 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 from, from, from Polish Ministry of the Digital Affairs. I've been working with the, uh, with the uh, uh, regulation of the platforms for many years, and uh, there's, there's always uh, uh, one basic question. Uh, are the uh, platforms uh, kind of the uh, chief editor or not? Because it's much more uh, answering for, for this question, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's for, for, from, from, from my point of view, for, for, for fundamental. What do you think? And the, and the second question is because the subject is also the self-regulation. Self uh, so, uh, uh, how do you think it's, uh, uh, it's possible to, to, to uh, self-regulate uh, those giants or not? Thank you for the question. Who wants to take the first one? Can I, can I start? Uh, once again, a very way to start the, 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 the conversation. Let me, let me get two things clear here. Uh, first thing is our approach is much, much more of a, of a Western world approach because we, we don't have any elements. Uh, in spite of the fact that we have a, a certain diversity independent, we have looked at a technical solution, a legal framework, and two perspectives from two other business fields. So I think it's a, it's a fair variety. But we have no way of looking, for example, as what happens within Vkontakte and with, with Weibo, with other digital platforms. So we're concentrating in this. And the other thing that goes a little bit more directly to your question is, I think it was Henry Louis Mencken, an American journalist, that, that once said that uh, for every complex problem, you find that there is a solution that is extremely simple, extremely clear, and miserably wrong. Because there's absolutely no way of addressing a complex issue from a simple approach. And, and I think uh, this idea of trying to see a gatekeeper for information as a chief editor tries to take us back to a world where we, a world where functions are known to us and very well established. Because we know from press law, from around, all around the world, what are the roles of a chief editor? What are the liabilities that fall upon his back? And we know how to do this, right? So, yes, the functions seem to be the ones of a chief editor. Yet, no chief editor in the world has been submitted to that amount and that a scale of creation. Now, do we just apply the system we know, the liability system for a content curator or a chief editor as we knew it from the, the past 100 years? Do we just let them, because this is another alternative, do you let them automate this task? Because it's already happening in, in many uh, private platforms, this automation of the curation, and certain kinds of decisions are already being taken on an automated basis. It would be already a system that we don't know because we have no liability. We have a liability system when there is a person curating the content. We not, do not have a reasonably developed liability system for. Uh, situations where this content curation or, or monitoring or oversight is automated or do we move to a place where we don't know yet where we try to understand this new characteristics of a person who does content curation but on, a, on, a, on an absolutely new basis I'm a little bit more for this for this exploring a new alternative right because I, I'm, I'm not very satisfied uh, the intermediary automated curation, which will happen to some extent, no matter how, because of the scale, but I'm not very satisfied with the rules 
with which this is happening in an automated pace. I'm trying to, to see if we can collectively build a, a, a third alternative somewhere we haven't seen before uh, yet. Thank you. Anyone else from the panel who wants to comment on the question? Um, yeah, thank you very much for, 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 for the question. And, uh, and yeah, we had a very interesting talk uh, last night uh, w w with Catherine uh, about this. And uh, it seems that we do everything or we do not do anything. And uh, we want to automate everything, we want to regulate everything, or we don't want to regulate anything. So I think we should start thinking a more, in a more systemic way in which are the areas that we can d demand, for example, law enforcement, where can we automate decision-making processes, where can we um, put more control, and, and in which uh, areas can be self-regulated by, by the service providers. I think this uh, uh, take it or leave it approach, it's, uh, it's not taking us anywhere, and, and we should put definitely more, more emphasis on trying to inspectionate the areas where we can work, work particularly and carry forward, some, make some progress. Thank you, Nicholas. If there is no one else on the panel, then we can move to the next question, if there is any in the audience. Yes, please. Hi, Michael Kendi. I just wanted to, to, as a comment and maybe question, raise an idea that I recently saw from uh, Jonathan Zittrain at Harvard, where he's saying if, if these are really platforms um, and uh, not editors, that uh, we should be able to design our own algorithm. That is, the sliders say how much we want of our friends' feeds, how much of New York Times, or from different areas, and just design our own feed and, and get that, and then even share our algorithm with others um, so that we're in charge of the algorithm rather than something that we can't, uh, can't see or um, understand. So I just wanted to, to raise the idea and get some reaction. Yeah, thanks a lot for this. Somebody else, comments, questions? Uh, thank you, Michelle um, Madoliazida. My question is to the panel. I, I, uh, I was glad that Nicholas uh, made that last comment about leave it at all or make it uh, full regulation. Uh, I want to, to, uh, to know how the panel thinks about different options for regulations even with a big mass of data and uh, possible things to go on from the panel side, uh, from the platform side. Uh, so uh, w we have like ex ante and we have proposed regulation. So th these are some alternatives. Uh, of course, with, with big amount of things to look into, you can also consider uh, auditing uh, mechanisms in, in some way, like taking samples of some decisions made by an algorithm or by a, a human being and looking into how decisions are taken on those. So uh, how, how do you think this uh, could provide some options for a way forward? Thank you for the question. Uh, who wants to take it? Nicholas. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, uh, as I said, uh, I think we should demand uh, more risk information on the, from the platforms. Um, but nowadays, the risk component, it's, it's really missing. Although in the GDPR, I mean, basically you have two, uh, I would say, in, in, in the area of privacy, uh, you have two instruments that are really, um, really important in, in this equation. You have on one side the GDPR, and on the other side you have the privacy policy. Um, the GDPR has a more risk-oriented semantic, I mean, in, in, in in Article 33, you, it was introduced uh, the risks to the rights of the data subject. So it's a more risk-oriented uh, instrument. But on the other hand, for example, the, the, the policy, I mean, I, I checked Facebook, uh, Twitter, and I, and I don't remember which other ones, uh, if I could find the word risk in, the, in the inside a policy, and it's not there. So in, in, in that case, as a consumer, we are not informed at what can go wrong, if there can be data leakage, if, they, if we can be hacked, if our information can be disclosed to third parties. Um, I think that this, at the end of the day, modulates our perception about the product that we are, that we are consuming or using in, 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 in this case, and I think it's not fair. I think w we deserve more information about, uh, about risks, and either in the policy, either in the interface, 
we can be creative, think out of the box. Uh, I have worked that on my on, on, on my research and with, with, with my research team. And uh, I think that, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, uh, I'm a computer scientist and I develop uh, usable privacy technologies. But I have, I truly believe that this is a way that can be explored and can be worked jointly with all the, the stakeholders in, in, of internet governance. Uh, let me say, it, it's a very fair question concerning the, the, regarding the theme. If we consider the theme we propose, a very fair question is let's look at a model and see what it looks like. And a fair question demands an honest answer. And the honest answer here is we don't know. We, of course, don't know. We haven't devised, fully designed that model. But I can tell you that there are a couple of elements that haven't, haven't been given enough attention as the, one of the, as the, as the risk, as, the, as some ex ante elements, the risk Nico has just mentioned, as education, which, another, which is another short to long term uh, element that was mentioned by Natalia in address, addressing also the question from our fellow here on the, on the left. Because yes, designing or weighing in in the design of how you see things or, or how algorithms behave in relation to you as a person is a very good option, but it takes awareness. And it's a kind of tech awareness that it's not uh, overall present in, in each end user as it is now. So education could be a way to achieve that as an element. These are pre-ex-ante uh, elements that we have not been considering. I, I do not think, and this is something I also want to make very clear, I'm not an activist, or at least I'm not wearing an activist hat here. I'm coming from university. My job there is to try to understand how, how things behave in a situation and then come up with a solution that is reasonable and implementable. And, and in that sense, I do not and I cannot believe in bad and good. I cannot be innocent, but I cannot believe in bad and good. So in the end of the day, it means I don't, I don't think that someone said, hey, you know what? You know how we could interfere in democracies 20 years from now, or how we could spread, help spread uh, terrorist videos, or how, how can we broadcast crimes live to increase the audience? This, uh, this, are not, this is not fair, this is not reasonable. This did not happen that way. Yet, corporate decisions along the time made the situations happen. They are here. And now how do how we deal with that? So I think using the same elements as analogy is a good way to start. But using the same uh, elements that we know as, uh, as the, 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 our drivers to the solution won't work. I think we're, we, ha we have to cook this a little bit more and come up with a, uh, with a better solution that is integrated. And now there's the thing. Maybe 20 years ago, the voice of civil society and academia including the channels through which we could make that voice resound, we're not there. I think we have a better opportunity now of weighing in. Yes. Finally, um, I just would like to add to what my colleagues um, uh, commented, that um, I will still put in the framework of solutions to uh, address your question, um, the, uh, the, the PPPs. Uh, and I think uh, provided that, uh, of course, there is transparency, as I mentioned in my presentation, on role, responsibilities, uh, governance of, of these PPPs. Um, I think it's also a, a doable uh, regulatory governance uh, sort of uh, framework in which it could work. Um, I think we have to, for this, we have to really look at use cases. Um, what I have found in the, in the course of my research is mostly in relation to cyber crimes. There are some uh, specific partnerships working, especially in the, in the framework of, of the uh, Council of Europe uh, Cyber Crime Convention. Um, and so, once again, the call will be looking at use cases and in order to determine whether there is transparency of these roles, these uh, you know, responsibilities, uh, and the all in all, the, go the governance framework. And I just want to use uh, this last minute to invite you to the lightning talk because we are continuing this conversation with Nicolas together, uh, putting together a um, uh, lightning talk on uh, awareness by design at one o'clock um, at the uh, mall area basement level min minus one. So please join us to continue with this conversation. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, I would really love to continue this discussion, but unfortunately we have to wrap up, and uh, I want uh, at this point to thank all speakers for making it here to Paris, for participating in this discussion, and thank you all for coming here and uh, listening to us and uh, also sharing your questions and comments on the issue. And uh,
Of course, the loudest arguments for or against something are always made by people who have uh, no desire to compromise, but I really believe that this is uh, the area where we have to compromise and where we have to work together to find the most efficient solutions. Thank you once again. Have a good day.